Chuck Andaris, and I'm an organic specialist at Moses. Uh, and today's uh, we're doing a, a virtual field day on or, uh, the economics of transitioning to organic, as well as some of the production aspects of it. Our guests today are John and Ruth Jovag from near Austin, Minnesota, and Paul Dittman from Compure Financial. Uh, and so they'll each go through some presentations, and we'll have some time for questions as well. Um, let's see, it's not letting me go through, oh yeah. Um, our field day is sponsored by Gemplers, they're our patron sponsor. Uh, so you can go to gemplers.com, they're a uh, family owned farm and home store. Um, <coughs> and it's in partnership with the North Central Region SARE, so this is part of our, our grant from them. Um, this is some information about Moses. If you know one thing about us, it's probably our, our annual conference, which will be virtual this year, just like this, due to COVID-19, um, as well as our other programs there. Um, and some tips for Zoom. So uh, put your name uh, in the participant tab. So a lot of people, it just comes up that way. You might have to put your name on there. Um, <clears throat> let us know where you're at. You can drop that in the chat, too, if you want. Um, use the chat function to ask questions as we go. Me and my coworker, my coworker. Stephanie will be monitoring the chat as we go and interjecting with questions, um, but that's the best way to do it. And then each presenter will have some time for questions at the end as well. Um, and then everyone will stay muted except for um, the presenters um, until we start the Q&A. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. I'll share your... Um, <coughs> your presentation here and you can just tell me uh, when you want me to go to the next slide. Okay, sounds good. All right, well I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. I'm Paul Dittman, I'm a Senior Lending Specialist on the Versified Markets team at um, Compure Financial. And Compure is part of the farm credit system. We're the farm credit system institution that handles uh, the eastern half of Minnesota about two thirds of Wisconsin and the northern half of Illinois. My specific role with, uh, with Compere is I run our Emerging Markets Loan Program, which is a loan program that's uh, for farmers who are marketing products directly to consumers or doing uh, value added processing or organics or managed grazing. So I work with a, a lot of different types of uh, farms and farm businesses. Maybe share a little more of my background. I've been with the company for um, going on nine years. Before that, I was at the State Department of Agriculture in Wisconsin, and I ran the Wisconsin Farm Center. And before that, I was a county ag agent for a number of years in Sauk County, which is uh, where I'm based still with Compure. And I spent, um, I think, seven or eight years on the Moses board uh, back in the day when, um, when the, uh, the headquarters of Moses was in a house trailer on Faye Jones' front yard and uh, was on through the, the transition to the office in Spring Valley. So, so again, glad to be with you today. Chuck, if you wanna uh, go to the next slide. So I just have a few suggestions I wanted to share with you based on, on experience working with a lot of farmers through the transition process and working uh, with them on business planning and putting cash flow projections together and, um, and some of the, the um, Kind of the pinch points that they've run into in the transition process and just hopefully giving you a few suggestions of things that you may want to consider as you as you make this move okay next slide so number one i really suggest that you start planning um, at least a year before you start the transition and that planning includes doing things like attending conferences and field days like this one here um, the Moses Conference when it's, uh, when it's in person or virtual. Uh, the Old Grain Conference is a really good organic grain conference that started back uh, three or four years ago at UW-Madison. There's an organic conference, uh, an organic grain conference in Illinois that's a bit smaller than Old Grain, but also a very good conference. I know there's some in Minnesota that I haven't been able to attend yet. So attending conferences, going to field days, meeting other farmers, um, meeting people in the industry, people who uh, sell seed, people who sell crop inputs. Um, you know, the more people that you can get to know and, uh, and hopefully turn into mentors at some point are just, just gonna help you in the, in the process of, of the transition. Uh, being a lender and being a, a numbers guy, I'm gonna tell you, run the numbers too um, in that first year. 
and before you get started in the transition, you want to make sure that the numbers are going to work out for you. If you can go to the next slide, Chuck. So there's two really good resources that came out within the last year uh, that can help you plan out the trans the uh, financial aspects of the transition. And both of these are available for free through Ograin, which is a project at UW Madison. It's run by Aaron Silva, who I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, there's the Ograin Compass, and the Compass is a it's an Excel-based um, tool that you can plug in all of your input costs, uh, your expected prices, your crop rotations. Uh, just a ton of information that you can plug into this tool, um, including um, any capital investments that you might, might uh, excuse me, might need to make, like if you need to purchase some new equipment, things like that. You can plug all of this into the Ograin Compass, and you can run out financial scenarios for uh, for 10 years. So it really helps you think through the process of of transition from an economic perspective. This tool was put together by Jim Munch, who maybe some of you know. Jim is a he's a farmer. Uh, he's also a farm business consultant. He's based in Crawford County, the southwestern part of Wisconsin. Um, and he did this, the Ograin Compass. At the same time that he was working on the Ograin Compass, I wrote the, this companion publication called Turning Grain into Dough. Both of these are available for free um, through Ograin. Um, the the uh, Compass and Turning Grain into Dough, they're pieces that fit together, but they can be used separately. So we tried to design it in a way that if you only like working with Excel-based spreadsheets, you can just use the Ograin Compass. You don't have to look at the publication. If you're only comfortable uh, looking at, at paper and pencil tools, then you can look at the publication or you can put the two together. And so, so that's a, uh, I would say there, this is the place to start. Get these two tools. Again, they're both available for free. And Jim and I are both available if you have questions and stuff, you can contact us. So uh, next slide, Chuck. As you're going through your financials, there's two things that you really should pay particular attention to. Number one is the farm's networking capital position. So networking capital, it's calculated from the farm's balance sheet. That's one thing that's not in the old grain uh, compass, and it's also, I didn't write anything about balance sheets in turning grain into dough, because we've, we've done a lot of stuff on that in other places. But um, if you have an updated farm balance sheet, you can calculate your networking capital position. Networking capital, we're just looking at the top part of the balance sheet. We're looking at current assets and current liabilities. Current assets, that's cash. Anything that's going to be converted to cash or anything that will be used up on the farm within a year's time. So it includes grain inventory. It includes uh, market livestock. It includes um, accounts receivable that hopefully someone owes you money, they're going to pay it, and it's going to turn into cash during the year. Um, it includes prepaid supplies and expenses because those are things that are going to be used up on the farm within a year's time. So those are all current assets. Current liabilities, that's anything that's due now or that's going to come due within a year's time. So it's operating loan balances. It's credit card balances. It's any uh, bills that are, are due and payable right now. It also includes any principal that's due um, longer term on a longer term loan. So it so if you have a mortgage on the farm, any of the principal that comes due within the next year is considered to be a current liability. Any principal due beyond a year is a long-term liability. So we want to include that in the current liability section. If we take current assets minus current liabilities, it gives us a dollar figure. That's the net working capital. We want to have positive net working capital before we go into a transition like this because you don't want to get in a situation where maybe the cash flow gets tight and all of a sudden your working capital is upside down. It's negative. So we want to make sure that before we go into the transition that we've got positive net working capital. That dollar figure of net working capital, we like that to be at least 15% of what you expect to make gross on the farm in a year's time. So if, you're, if you expect to gross $100,000 from the farm, we should have $15,000 in net working capital when we do that calculation. If we're short of that, we should try to build that up. And there's ways of doing that. We won't get into that today, but um, but there are ways of building up that networking capital position if it's falling short. It's a really important measure to, to keep track of, not just before the transition, but keeping track of it during the transition all the way through. In fact, right now I've been telling um, conventional farmers that they really, with the situation that we've had in conventional ag for the last four or five years, really tough, uh, tough market conditions and tough weather conditions uh, the last couple of years, um, networking capital has really been sliding for a lot of folks and, and trying to monitor that on a monthly basis all the way through the year is, is really important. 
So that's one thing to pay particular attention to. The other thing is to look at monthly cash flow projections during the transition years. The Old Grain Compass will take you through an annual cash flow projection, um, but it won't go month by month. Um, it's really important to know your month by month cash flow and try to anticipate what months you're going to be short of cash and have a plan to deal with those shortages before it happens. You don't want to be sitting down writing out checks and all of a sudden uh, the checking account is empty and you're letting some bill slide for a month or two or you're putting things on credit cards. That's, that's uh, a terrible way to handle, handle your cash flow. And so doing a cash flow projection ahead of time, uh, anticipating when it's going to be short, and then you can come up with a plan, whether it's changing when you sell products, what, um, if you've got capital assets that you are intending to sell, plugging that in, maybe it's off farm income, maybe it's an operating loan. There's a lot of things that you can do if you can anticipate ahead of time when cash is gonna be short. Ready for the next slide, Chuck. So this is what a, a cash flow projection might look like for the first year of the transition. Um, here in Wisconsin, a lot of folks will, will transition to organic uh, by seeding ground down to hay and having hay for uh, the years of transition and then um, then rotating into corn. And um, I know that uh, John and Ruth actually were able to take some land that was in hay production and plant into it right away because they hadn't used any inputs uh, and were able to certify right away, which is ideal. That's, it's a huge advantage that we have in the upper Midwest is that we've got a market for hay. We've got a need for it. We've got livestock still. And so if we can, if we can transition with hay, um, it's going to help a lot. But being able to anticipate what the cash flow is going to look like, and the way that we read this, you see the, the twenty thousand dollars that's circled up there in January. So that's the beginning cash balance in the farm checking account January first. They've got twenty thousand dollars in the checking account. There's no cash income from the farm, and I left the I left any off farm income out of this just for simplicity. But there's no income coming in until September when they've got some hay to sell because this is the first year seeding. Um, but they've got a bunch of expenses that have to be paid during the year, right? So they've got, uh, they've got some expense for custom hire, they've got uh, soil amendments that have to be paid for in April, they've got an insurance bill that comes due, they've got land rent that has to be paid. So there's a lot of cash that's going out, but there's no cash coming in. They start with that 20,000 and then stuff is coming out of there over the months. They don't get any, any cash coming the other direction until September. This can get pretty complicated for some farm operations where they've got livestock income, um, they've got off-farm income, they've got a lot of, of uh, other expenses. And so we want to monitor the bottom line every month to make sure that the cash flow is positive. And if it's not, again, come up with a plan to, to deal with it. I saw a question pop up there. Um, this is uh, a projection for the first year of transition. So this is someone has decided they're going to transition 40 acres to organic, sort of, uh, organic production, and they're going to do that by planting it to hay in, uh, in running hay for two or three years and then um, certifying it organic and, and planting it to corn. This little spreadsheet, um, I'm happy to share with you. It's just a little Excel spreadsheet. My email address is there, um, is on this screen. It's also on the very last screen of my presentation. So send me an email and I'll, I'll shoot you this little spreadsheet back again. It's a really handy um, little sheet. and I've, I've shared it with thousands of farmers over the years. Okay, next slide, Chuck. Um, next suggestion would be to talk to your lender early in the process. You know, you want to make sure that your lender is on board with what you're doing. And, and again, if you're anticipating that you're going to be short of cash flow, or if your working capital is going to uh, be tight at some point, or it's tight now, you want to be talking to your lender early in the process. Let them know what you're planning to do and make sure that they're on board with you. If they're not, then you maybe want to look for another lender. And of course, I'm highly biased. I hope that you're going to come to us. But there are other lenders uh, around the country that understand organics. Uh, Flanagan State Bank in Illinois is one that's really good. Uh, German American Bank in Northern Illinois is really good. There are a number of other lenders that, that understand organics and can help you. You want someone who's really a partner with you and understands organics, supports organics, understands the cash flow of organics and, um, and how, the, how that transition process looks as well. So make sure that, that you've got a lender who's on board with you and, and understands and supports what you're doing. Next slide, Chuck. Don't transition too many acres at once. This is a mistake that I see some people make where um, they're, they're enthused about 
transitioning to organic. They're looking at conventional corn at $3.40 a bushel right now, cash market for fall delivery. And they're saying, you know what, I want out of that. And I, I kind of like the idea of eight, nine, ten dollars a bushel for corn. I'd like to transition as many acres as I can over to organic as quickly as possible. There's this pretty steep learning curve, and it takes time to, to understand an organic system and really kind of get into the flow of it and understand the, the equipment that's needed and the inputs that you're going to use and uh, what the markets are. There's a lot of things that you need to learn. And so starting slow, um, transitioning a few acres and then sort of bring more into the rotation. And I know John and Ruth are going to talk more about that. They started at a pretty small scale and, and have transitioned more acres since. And so um, that's a really smart way to go about it. Next slide, Chuck. Um, it helps to think about the transition as a long-term investment in your farm operation. And when we think about something in terms of investment, you know, we make an investment in something, we put money into something today, hoping that we're going to get a return at some point in the future. You know, if I put money into a retirement account today, I don't expect to take it back out again later this year. I'm plugging it in this year, and I'm hoping maybe 15 years from now, it's going to come back to me, and it's going to come back in a lot bigger numbers than it went in. Right, and so my cash flow is going to be negative as I put money into it, and then it's going to turn positive at some point in the future. And organic production is the same way. You know, you might have two or three years where the cash flow is negative or maybe marginal during the transition years, um, but we we need to get to that third, fourth, fifth year where we're certified and we've got organic crops to sell and we're selling them at a good price and in in, uh, in a good profit margin. And so I think it helps if we if we can. Um, understand the concept of internal rate of return, which is what this little uh, calculator on the side here is. Um, I won't get too deep into that right now. I've got a, another presentation that I do just on, on um, uh, investment in farm capital assets and things that, that I go into it in a lot more detail, but it's a really powerful tool is understanding internal rate of return and thinking about the organic transition that way. Next slide, Chuck. Try to keep your variable cost as low as possible on your transitional acres. And variable costs, uh, when, we, when we put together an enterprise budget for a cropping enterprise, for example, we break the costs into variable costs and overhead costs. Variable costs are all the costs that you wouldn't have if you weren't producing anything. In other words, if you're not producing a crop, you're not gonna have any seed cost. You're not gonna have any cost for inputs. You're not gonna have any land rent. So variable costs are the costs that you're typically sitting down you're paying it for in cash every year. Um, the less negative your cash flow is during the transition, the higher the internal rate of return will be on that transition. So if you can keep your, your um, cash output really, really low during the transition years, um, that's gonna, gonna help your bottom line. Now I mentioned there's two types of costs. So there's variable costs. Those are the costs that you wouldn't have if you weren't producing anything. They're gonna go up every acre that you increase your production. Um, there's, over, there's also overhead costs, and costs, uh, those overhead costs are the kinds of costs you're going to have whether you're producing anything or not. So in other words, if you own land, you're going to have to pay property taxes on that land whether you're producing anything on it or not, right? Your assessor doesn't care if you're growing crops or sitting uh, idle, you're still going to have to pay your property taxes on that. Um, if you've got a mortgage, your principal and interest payments are overhead costs. You have to make those payments whether you're producing a crop or not. And so you, you have less control over those overhead costs than you do the variable costs. And um, you also have some things that are included in overhead costs like depreciation that aren't a cash expense. You're not sitting down right now to check for depreciation. It's a true cost. It's going to catch up to you at some point when that equipment wears out and it has to be replaced or a building has got a roof that's caved in or something. Um, depreciation is a real expense, but it's not something that you're going to write out a check for each year like you will with variable costs. So that's why keeping those variable costs really focused on those and trying to keep those as low as possible is really important during the transition. Next slide, Chuck. So that's all I really got for, for a formal presentation today. There's my contact information. I'm happy to answer any questions that, that uh, anybody might have. Yeah, so at this point, you could just unmute yourself and ask any questions if you have them. Usually waiting for questions, you have to sit with a little bit of silence.
while we're waiting here, Chuck, maybe I'll just mention um, another good resource is the book Fearless Farm Finance, which is a, a Moses publication. Uh, Craig Chase, Jody Padgham, and I wrote that a number of years ago. We came out with the second edition a few years back. Uh, but it's got a chapter on, on uh, capital investment analysis. Like I mentioned, internal rate of return. There's a whole chapter on that in Fearless Farm Finances. Um, there's stuff on enterprise budgeting. There's stuff on cash flow projections and balance sheets and all sorts of information. So just want to put in a plug for that. All right. I got a, I got a question in the chat uh, directly to me that said, do you have any examples of livestock integrated spreadsheets? I don't. Yeah, I don't really have an example that I could share. I mean, I've got I've got farmers that I work with who who have integrated livestock into their um, into their enterprise during the transition. But yeah, I don't have anything that's that's publicly available at this point. And I don't believe the old grain compass. I don't believe allows for livestock. I don't know that for a fact, but I don't I don't recall having a place where we could plug livestock into it. There is a livestock compass um, through right. the same folks, but um, I like I don't I'm not sure if it's if you can connect them as as one enterprise. I'm I don't know. Any other questions? <laughs> Otherwise, we can uh, if you have questions at the end that you think of. Um, for Paul, we can we can always loop back around to that, but um, now we can shift gears and uh, Joan and Ruth can take over. So I'm going to put their their slideshow up here. All right, Joan and Ruth, you can take it away. Hey. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm John, and this is my wife Ruth, and. Um, yeah, we farm down by Austin, Minnesota, just a little south of there. And um, um, so I guess that can, we can just move to the first, the next, yeah, that's a picture of our farm, kind of an aerial view. And that was, picture was taken probably, oh, I don't know, six, six, uh, six or seven years ago. So there's been, we've made quite a few changes over the last six or seven years on the place. But, um, uh, but that was the aerial photo we had. So you can go to the first slide, uh, Chuck. Yeah, so uh, basically our vision, I guess, with, with our farm is uh, our, we have a goal of a healthy, regenerative farm, not just kind of a sustainable farm. And the joke that I've heard about that is um, if somebody asks you, uh, you know, how's your marriage and you say sustainable, there might be a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of concern. People going, oh boy, can we help? And if you say, hey, our you know, marriage is regenerative, it's kind of building and everything, that's, uh, that's a much better <laughs> mindset to have. You know, we're kind of conservation-minded on our farm with, and we want to think about long-term decisions. Uh, just like they were saying earlier, long-term decisions, there can be a lot of impact. Not just this year, but looking at five, seven, 10, 12 years down the road, even 30 or 40 years down the road. And uh, we're really working hard to increase our farm input costs and grow and produce what we need with kind of balancing livestock and, and crops and rotations and things to try to maximize the manure and nutrient needs of the crops and uh, using beneficial crop rotations. We really want to get healthier soil. We have a lot, a long way to go, but we're working on it. And then um, financially viable. I mean, that's obviously a very important part of any farm. And then we do want to share our lessons uh, that we learned because, you know, we make plenty of mistakes along the way with anybody. So, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you have questions, we're, we're more than happy to tell you where we, uh, things went well or didn't go well. So you go to the next slide, Chuck. So just a quick timeline of what what we've done. In, in 2011, uh, returned to the family farm. I spent quite a few years. I graduated from the University of Minnesota. Uh, then I spent quite a few years working out in the industry doing different things. And when I returned, uh, my dad, he's, he, uh, uh, he's been very conservation-minded for many years and tried a lot of different things. But he was, you know, conventional GMO corn, soybean rotations, and he had a little bit of hay because he had a few cattle. And, um, but we knew, you know, that we had limited acres, and we knew we had to add a lot of value in order to stay as a profitable operation. So in 2011, we purchased some hair sheep uh, for crop rotations, things like that. And then in 2012, 
we purchased the first sows and we started doing farrow to finish with uh, niche market production. We have antibiotic free pigs that we kind of uh, uh, sell in a, in a niche market through Niagara Ranch. Then in, in 2014, that was going okay, but in, in 2014, uh, like I said earlier, we certified our first field. It was just a 12 acre hay field that had been in hay for a few years and we could certify it right away. And uh, we did that strongly after uh, my wife here strongly <laughs> encouraged me to try it. So I was a little hesitant, wasn't too sure on it. And we were kind of talking a lot about it. We'd gone to the Moses conference, we'd gone to some other things and I uh, thought, well, you know, let's try it at 12 acres and see what happens. And, uh, you know, we started small, but um, we did it and uh, we made a lot of mistakes on that first 12 acres in terms of I bought an old cultivator that it was giving me grief and I was trying to adjust and set and it kept raining and did a lot of different things. Uh, there was a lot of opportunity to improve. And uh, we only got about a little over 100 bushel an acre on that 12 acres, which most people would say, oh man, you know, that's terrible. But we sold it for 10 bucks a bushel. And I stepped back and I thought, you know, I made more on a, that than I did on our conventional ground. And I thought, man, and I made a lot of mistakes. Just imagine if I did a couple things right, it might work out well. So we, we started doing more and more, and Ruth, Ruth and I were both, <laughs> kind of got really energized about it, really started thinking about a lot of different things about the whole farming operation in terms of how we can really build this into something, uh, I don't know, something a lot mm -hmm. bigger, not, not in terms of size, not in terms of acres, but just in terms of uh, production, ways of, ways of raising, <laughs> raising crops. So from 2015 to 2019, we started transitioning uh, certifying more acres and more fields. You know, we kind of slowly worked up the first few years as we built up equipment and everything else. And then, then the last couple of years, we've really jumped in. So you can go to the next slide, Chuck. Uh, and yeah, there's just some snapshots of some of the pigs. You know, we started raising pigs and, and, and sheep. And the pigs have been a good kind of a, a steady source of some income uh, throughout the years, even throughout the transition. Uh, because like they, like, uh, like they said earlier, those years can sometimes be a little, uh, you know, the transitioning time, you, you know, there's, there's um, a little more risk in that transition. You know, it's a little harder to do, but, uh, but looking at the long-term uh, benefits. So you can go to the next slide. So right now, uh, looking forward, now and looking forward, we've got, currently we have about 180 uh, acres that are certified as, as organic, you know, 100 acres approximately, that we're about two years in, 24 months into the transition, and 140 more acres that are just about one year in the transition. Uh, and then we're kind of in the process of, we're working and purchasing another little, little farm right next to us, another 50 acres that we would have to transition in. Uh, and we're also looking to buy some cattle uh, for some more diversification, diversification and to utilize some of the crops because through the different rotations, Animals are a very good, um, at least in my experience, animals are a very good uh, additional feature to just having that really good system. Uh, system looking at the, at the farm as an entire system because there's very few real healthy systems out there that don't have animals as a part of it. They, kind of, they, they work together very well, I feel. So by in 2022, hopefully the whole farm will be certified organic. So we started in 2014, by 2022, now we might have everything certified. So, you know, there's definitely a few years in there of, of kind of learning, growing, and working our way through. Um, but we're hoping, and then on that, that other farm, we're also hoping to do more produce and rotationally graze the sheep along with cattle and uh, keep working on our whole system. So you can go to the next slide. Oh, and then, uh, <laughs> One thing we look at, a little joke I had on the bottom of that was that uh, I've heard other organic farmers talk and they, they've said that um, I'd rather be signing the uh, backs of checks instead of the fronts of checks. So that's something that we kind of think about when we're making these decisions. It's a joke, but it is something to take serious in terms of saying, hey, where can we limit or how can we, we produce and limit things that so we aren't spending money. Can we do rotations? Can we do other things in order to prevent some of that 
outflow of cash. So, okay, next, next slide. And yeah, so, so we're doing a lot of, we're doing more rotations than we did, you know, as just a corn soybean uh, rotation is what we were doing prior to that. And, you know, rotations are something that uh, are kind of fun, but it takes time to kind of work through how, what crops can we grow? What can we do? What are some things that, that might work better? And when we look at different rotations, some of the questions that, that Ruth and I will talk about uh, when we're having coffee in the morning is, is um, you know, what crops will benefit the next crop? So you kind of really look at, at those types of things. What crops can really build the soil? What are some, some cover crops or rotations that can really help build up that soil? So you have healthier soil, which then can produce healthier cash crops. Uh, which ones can lower some of the input costs? Because some crops may, um, we, we may end up, uh, maybe some crops may not cash flow as well, but if they can cut some inputs for the next crop, that helps the overall system. So when we're looking at our whole farm, the cash flow of the whole farm, you got to look at the whole farm. You can't, it's harder in an organic rotation to look at just this one crop and then this one crop and this one crop, you kind of have to look at all of them and how they all link together. Uh, and a big thing with organic is how do we help control weeds? Because certain crops, we, um, you, you know, you harvest them at different times throughout the year, you plant them at different times, and which ones can really break up that weed cycle. And we are barely getting to where we kind of understand that. I think we're, we're on the learning curve on that. So, and then where can we sell, obviously sell the crop or can I use it for feed? Because that's the nice thing of having animals in the mix is certain crops you can just use for feed for your livestock or if you have a kind of a disaster in a field, I, I'll joke with the neighbors when I'm trying some of these things, trying different things. I say, well, you know, come August, you'll either see me, uh, you'll either see a nice crop out here, or you see me cutting it to bale it to feed to the cattle or the, the, the sheep. Either way, I'm getting something out of it, but hopefully they work. And then, uh, so, so you can go to the next slide. So we've got a couple of different rotations that we're getting started with all of this. We're, we're wanting to do a lot more as we go, but uh, uh, the first one is an oat field pea mix that, um, that we'll plant uh, early in the spring and then we harvest the oats, the oats and the actual hard field peas. And then I use the field peas in the, the ration for pigs. So then I can cut down on corn and soybean meal that goes into the pig feed. And then the oats, uh, I have a, a cleaner that I can separate those off. Some of the oats we might feed and some we might sell, uh, depending upon uh, auctions and markets. And then, the, then we'll come in by September 15th and we'll, roll, we'll plant uh, uh, fall seeded rye, we want that in before September 15th, at least in southern Minnesota, so that we can, the next year, we can come in and roller crimp uh, soybeans, roller crimp the rye and plant and no-till soybeans into it. And um, that, you know, that's been a learning curve over the last few years to have that whole system work for us. And then we'll come back with corn, so, uh, or organic corn. And that's actually how we transition some of our fields too is, is if we didn't do the hay transition, we'll come in and do the oats field peas, then roller crimp rye, and then, and then come in by the third year, corn is, is then can be certified organic when we sell that. Oh, yeah, my wife, or, yeah, you can. Oh, I just saw a question pop up about whether or not the animals are certified organic. And no, they are not currently. Um, like John mentioned, our pigs are antibiotic free and have more space and all that, but yeah, we deep haven't bedded, deep bedded no pits, uh, that type of stuff. But we haven't taken the leap yet to certifying any of the organic any of the animals as organic, but that's something that we're really looking into and if, whether or not they cash flow and I'd like and to do that. Pits. We would like to do that. That is hopefully in our future. Yeah, we'll we'll see how that all Ranch program has worked out very well for us, so we're kind of happy with that. So then we can go to the next, next slide. And here's just, then I've got a few pictures of this. These pictures were just taken in the last few days. 
And so this is a oats field pea mix here. And uh, the one thing you do notice in organic production is you will have a few weeds no matter what you do. And so I got a good picture of some giant ragweed coming in there too. The advantage of like the oats field peas, we got those planted earlier and, and the goal is that we can, we can cut and harvest this prior to the giant ragweed actually becoming, producing seed. So even if we have some weeds, if we can get them cut, get them harvest, get, get through that field prior to the weeds germinate or uh, prior to the weed, the, the weeds having viable seeds, well, you know, we might have some weeds out there, but that's still kind of a, a win. So you can go to the next slide. This is just a close up. You can see the field peas climbing up onto the oats and, and the hope is that, that when we harvest, we're actually gonna harvest the peas themselves. Some people will take this and they'll, they'll uh, cut it and use it for forage for cattle. It makes a good silage, but, uh, but we're actually gonna harvest the peas themselves. So next slide. Uh, and then after that, we'll come in with the rye cover crop. There's a picture of my dad and myself standing out in the rye. This was, oh, probably a couple weeks before we crimped it, I suppose. I don't know exactly when this was. But uh, yeah, the rye got a little taller than this. It was almost up to my, almost up to my head when we go out there and plant our soybeans. So the next slide. And this is, this is a picture taken, I think, yesterday or the day before of our soybeans. You can see them out there. In the, in the rye, we, we flattened the rye and planted the soybeans, and they're coming and they look pretty good out there. So we're pretty, I'm pretty excited about how that's, that's turning out. And uh, we put 15 inch rows, it's a no-till drill, 15 inch row uh, soybeans. So you can go to the next slide. And uh, that's just another picture. You can see there's a few sprigs of rye that kind of pop up on there even after we roll and crimp it, but I'm not too worried about it. It shouldn't help. Uh, you know, shouldn't help that. I did just saw a thing that came up. You, you have um, weeds that come up after you harvest the oats and before the rye. We will get a little of that in that time frame, but I'll work the field up uh, prior to planting the, the, the rye in the fall. And it, if I plant the rye by the first or second week of September, uh, the main thing is, is you want to get out there and make sure that those weeds that do come after you do the, the the oats and field peas do not get viable seeds. So, okay, you can go to the next slide. The other thing that we tried this year, every year we try a handful of things on a few acres that are different. Here we, we planted, I planted uh, rye. Winter rye I planted in, uh, it would have been about the first of June. And then I planted soybeans in them about three or five days, what was it? Three to five days after I planted the, uh, the rye. And so the goal is that that rye for weed control will come up and then die. If, if winter rye doesn't freeze, it doesn't produce a viable seed, is what I've been told. Other people might know more about that than I do. I'm hoping that I'm right on that, that <laughs> I'm hoping that was good information. But uh, we're just trying it on a couple of acres. And I'm going to see how that works with, um, uh, with, for weed control and weed suppression. And... Uh, this, this was after we had some sunflowers with a bunch of cover crops in with the sunflowers last year. And then we, this year we worked it up this spring and planted the rye and the soybeans right after it. And you can see there's a few of the cover crop that came up. There's some radish in there and there's some, uh, uh, oh, a few other cover crop plants that came up. But I'm not too worried about those. They aren't really a, uh, they aren't, I don't think will be too hard on the soybeans by any means. So we'll see how this all works out. Uh, time will tell. So um, uh, the one thing with organic is you always need a plan B and a plan C and a plan D because the weather and things like that don't always go according to plan. So, uh, so we're looking and, and trying different things on a couple of acres here and a couple of acres there to see what we can make work. So you can go to the next slide. And here's just, just a quick snapshot of the, the corn after the soybeans. You can see a couple of spots out in that field where we've got a little weed pressure. Um, and, uh, but overall, it looks pretty good. This was taken a couple of days ago now. But, uh, and we did have to add fertilizer to this after the soybeans. I got pelletized chicken litter, or pelletized uh, yeah, chicken poultry pellets. And I spread that 
out on the field there. We're hoping to get more utilized. We have, we do use our manure on, on fields, but I didn't have enough manure for everything that we were doing. So I had to buy some inputs. And that's kind of an expensive input that we're hoping we can kind of work systems over the years to kind of limit that because that's a very expensive input. So next slide. Then we have another rotation that we run on some of our ground with um, uh, oats with a hay underseeding and we just do hay for a couple of years and then then we will come back and put uh, fall or spread our own manure on there and then fall plow that and come in with corn and that is the uh, um, that's a very easy rotation this is in terms of trying to keep weeds down and having good healthy corn but um, uh, but we don't want that much hay produced on our farm or I mean we want to do do other crops and do other things in there too and some of our ground we can't get the cattle to very easily or the sheep or, or anything like that out too so uh, so we're looking at, at multiple rotations so depending on the fields and, and where it's at we've got some ground that's irrigated and some that isn't so you can go to the next slide just a quick picture of that's our oats and you can see a few weeds out there, of course, but, uh, uh, but not too bad. And then the next slide. Uh, and that's just one of our hay fields. Um, and we'll hay that or pasture that for a couple of years. And then we'll, we'll cover it in manure in the fall and, uh, and plow it down. And then the next slide here, Chuck. Then the corn, that's, that was taken a couple of days ago. That's our organic corn field. And that is a beautiful looking field that uh, <laughs> you'll be hard pressed to find hardly any weeds out there. And the corn looks great. It looks better than our other corn fields. And so it's kind of nice to have one that, uh, one that looks really nice. And, and the biggest advantage is this is one right on the county road. <laughs> so people can drive by and see a real nice one. I do have others that uh, maybe aren't quite as nice, but uh, you can have a mix. So. Okay, next slide. Um, and then some other rotations. We're looking at doing a four-way rotation using other crops. We're doing like trial ground, uh, a few acres with sunflowers and heavy cover crop mix. We're trying some buckwheat and I wanna try some winter wheat. And so that way we can kind of look at other options and other crops uh, to, enhance our rotations and cut down on weed pressure because some of these crops like like say buckwheat isn't planted until June. Uh, the sunflowers with the cover crop mix we tried that last year and we're doing it again this year that that worked out well it was just a few acres but we're, we're trying to look at other other crops and other options. So next slide. Yeah here's just a picture or uh, of uh, here you can kind of see it looks, it, I'll have neighbors drive by and go, aren't you ever gonna cultivate that field? And um, the point is this is sunflowers, you can see the rows of sunflowers, but in there, most of that I actually planted. You can see one uh, common ragweed that I did not plant. But um, we've got a, what do we have in there? It's, it's two types of some buckwheat, we've got uh, a little bit of oats, we've got some- uh, Sorry, Johnny, uh, your sound cut out for a second there when you're listening. Oh, you start okay. Why, well, where did I um, get cut off? Uh, you were just saying what, what mix you planted in there. Oh yeah, the mix that we have in here, um, the, the mix that we have in here with the sunflowers would be, we've got a little bit of oats, we've got some buckwheat, we've got two types of clover, um, and we've got some um, uh, uh, radish and turnips. I think that's what's all in this. So you can see the rows of sunflowers and then we've got all the other stuff that's planted in there. So my goal is to do as least, as little tillage as possible. So we're just doing a few acres of this again. Um, and then we'll follow it next year if that uh, soybean with spring winter rye uh, works this year. You know, we might do those types of things, but our goal is to do as, as few passes over the field as you can, uh, because I think there's a lot of opportunity to enhance the soil and 
and grow good crops. And this worked last year. We had a little bit different cover crop mix with our sunflowers last year, but, uh, but that worked well. But we only do a few acres of each of this. Uh, right now until we kind of figure out a good system and figure out how it works. And if we can harvest it, if we can do what we can do with it, to sell it, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of learning that we have to do with all of this. So, okay, next slide. There's a question in the chat that says, are the sunflowers buckwheat winter wheat after each other or are they rotated with the corn or soybeans? Well, um, the, um, the core, the right now, like the buckwheat, I actually just planted buckwheat on a, I just had a nine acre field of oats that I was going to roll in with uh, uh, rye planted, but I had a lot of weed pressure in there. So I actually went and worked up the oats and I planted the buckwheat and I've got a market for that buckwheat, I think. So um, they're not, I would like to add them into our large rotations and get more rotations, but right now they are not, actually in a, in a specific rotation, we're just doing a few acres of each of these crops to um, learn and understand the best way to raise them. So, and to make sure that I can do this sunflowers with a cover crop mix and not do any cultivation, not do any tillage, other than the initial tillage when you plant the crops, but not to do any throughout the year because for, um, for labor, you know, sometimes your, your hay, you know, you, you got to hay and cultivate and, and um, you know, you got to do all these things. And, and if the weather doesn't cooperate, you've got to do, you know, 15 different things in four days. You know, the less, that's with the roller crimping of soybeans or like with the sunflower system uh, or the buckwheat, the less acres that we have to get all that stuff done, uh, easier it is for us on labor. Because the, the labor is just my wife and myself and then my dad. And then we've got some kids who help when they can, but they're all in school and everything else. So that's kind of our, our system. So Do you custom hire any work? Do we custom hire? Um, not much. We did custom hire this year I, uh, to cut up the, the rye, because even the next year when we went to plant the corn into the rye, I have a neighbor who has a uh, vertical till machine, and I did hire him to come and run through that once. Um, because that vertical till machine really cut up that, uh, all that trash that was on top of the field. It was really, it was still, that rye was still a thick mat even after uh, a year, or basically a year of, uh, uh, of just letting it sit there. It was, you know, I was kind of worried about how I was going to take care of that. That, that vertical till machine worked really well to uh, kind of size that material up and get it so you get the corn in there. We also hired some bean walkers last summer to help yeah. with some weeds coming up in the soil. Yeah. So that was, other than that though, we don't have any regular employees. Yeah, and no, we try, we don't custom hire too much. Uh, those would be the two things that we've done. But the, um, last year we had about a 20 acre spot in the bean field where we had a lot of giant ragweed coming. So yeah, we hired a crew to come in and they spent a day or a little over a day and they just went out there and got rid of all of that. So that, that uh, was a big help to have them yeah. come and do that because it was... It was more than the two of us could get yeah, done. Yeah, we, we knew we weren't going to so, get that done. <laughs> so, so we yeah. had to call in some... That's part of that plan. Some reinforcements. Plan C, plan D that you were talking about, it sounds like. Right, right. Yeah, to have multiple thoughts and multiple options, just like the, the buckwheat. We planted that because the, the weeds in, the, in that one little field of, of oats were really coming on strong and I wanted to, uh, and I don't want to, um, um, I, I didn't want the weeds to get out of control. There was some thistle in there and thistle is a very irritant, the Canadian thistle. And then we had other, a lot of giant ragweed and I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna go in there and work it all up and put the buckwheat in there instead of the oats, even though the oats weren't, I mean, we could have harvested some oats out of that field, but I just felt like it was more important to get the weeds out of there and get a second crop in of oats, that, or of, uh, of buckwheat that, um, that we can harvest and sell and, and should cash flow. That's one advantage of, of organic is there's multiple crops 
that you can grow and still cash flow. So you can go to the next, next slide. Here's the buckwheat. This was taken yesterday or the day before. You can see it's just starting to come and that you can still see the oats double from when I worked, worked up the field. Uh, you know, the oats were, you know, you can see the heads on the oats and everything, but I just wanted to take care of it. So, so we put the buckwheat in and that'll be kind of, I have not grown buckwheat before. Um, so it'll be a learning curve. It's just on a, a eight acre field, nine acre field, but, uh, but we really want to try it and see how that can fit as a, a plan B. The nice thing about it is it doesn't, you don't need to plant it until June. Uh, so it gives you kind of a fallback. You need a few of them. There's other crops too that you can grow, but that's just one of many. So next slide. Thanks. This is, uh, here's, then I did uh, plant some uh, rye last year, and that's what's in the close part here is the rye. And I'm actually going to harvest that rye as rye seed, and then I'll clean it, and then that's what I'll use for my fall rye um, there. This, so trying to, to save, save seed, save costs, do, do things like that. And then you can see in the far part of the field there, that's the soybeans that were roller crimped uh, down into the rye. So I see somebody here has a raised hand. Raised hand. I'm not sure. Any, anyway, you can go to the next slide. Uh, just a so yeah, uh, Carmen, uh, if you want to just put your questions in the chat and then we can get to them as, as we have time. Okay. <laughs> so then this is the, uh, um, it, just another picture of the, the rye that we're probably going to harvest as rye. I actually was going to roller crimp this field and plant it all in soybeans, this rye even here. But I, last fall, I didn't get this 10 acre strip planted until almost the first of, um, it was the 27th of September when I got this rye planted. And when you went out there and looked, you know, if you plant your rye for roller crimping too late in the year, you don't get as much biomass at the beginning, you know, that, that you need for the weed suppression for the soybeans. And I went out and I just tried a couple of passes through this stuff that was late planted rye. And I could tell that I wasn't going to have enough coverage to keep the weeds suppressed. And so I just quit. I said, I'm not going to do it. I'll just harvest the rye. And so that was my plan B, I guess, on this, because it rained, I couldn't get it planted when I wanted to last fall. So then I'm just going to keep it as, as, as rye itself. So next slide. Then another quick thing is, a big thing, I shouldn't say quick, a big thing is um, equipment that we've had to update, you know, with the corn soybean rotation, uh, and we had hay, so we did have hay equipment when I came back to farm, but, or my dad did, uh, that we've rented and worked, worked through with my dad. But then we've had to buy and upgrade a variety of equipment in order to transition to uh, organic. And that's been a learning curve as we've gone. But this is just a list of things that I think we have picked up here in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Uh, multiple years, I guess, so six years. So it's, it's, it's nothing you can do all in one year typically, or most, <laughs> maybe some can, but I, we couldn't. And so you kind of build as you go and, uh, you know, look for, for auction sales, you know, some things we've had to drive a little ways to pick up, but we got a row crop cultivator, obviously, um, rotary hoe, tine weeder, we had to get a large grain drill. We just had a 10 foot grain drill and we were planting a hundred and some acres of small grains and doing cover crops and all this kind of stuff. I, I went and bought a 30 foot grain drill. Uh, we bought a fertilizer spreader, a Gandhi air seeder that I mounted on top of our disc. And then I can, so I, because we still, some nutrients were low, we have to uh, add elemental sulfur uh, to the ground so I can add that in with the Gandhi seed box and that works, you know, it's organic. Uh, Omri approved, and um, then I can also seed cover crops and things with that Gandy cedar. Uh, roller crimper, 
a no-till uh, soybean drill um, uh, that, that I used to get the soybeans in, a 21-foot swather. We had to go to practically North Dakota to pick that up. Uh, a pickup head for our combine so we can pick up small grains because we just had a, a bean head and a corn head. Uh, the other thing that's really handy with organic when you transition is to have more smaller big grain bins instead of one or two large ones because we grow a lot of different crops and you have to think about, hey, where am I going to store all these things? Um, so it was, you know, that was a big thing. So there's one that says, did I tailor equipment? Oh, I didn't see that. Um, I think, did we tailor it for organic? Um, the implements. Or were we able to find it for? Oh, we tailored it just for the organic. While we transitioned to organic, we this was just what we could find around, but we tailored it, or we, we, we bought it as we realized we needed it, like the swath or I had to go, you know, we tried taking our oats straight using our bean head and that worked one or two years, one year, two years, and totally flopped one year. <laughs> and when it totally flopped one year, we realized, nope, we've got to do this and it's time to get stuff. So just as you go, um, we kind of build, built and up. As we by go. and large, the equipment that we purchased is used. Oh yeah. So yeah. John spends a lot of time looking like at online, farm auctions and these farm mm -hmm. auction with or the farm websites where um we can pick stuff up for as good of a deal as we can mm -hmm. get <laughs> yeah yeah so uh and then but like like i was saying the smaller green bins that's kind of nice because you can actually because because we might especially during transition we have um you you might have uh, a conventional crop a conventional corn, you might have uh, organic corn, and you might have oats, and the conventional oats, transitional oats, and organic oats, and they all have to be stored separately. So you, you, you can't mix them, so you gotta kinda keep everything separate and organized, and boy, if you just have a couple of big bins, you're gonna be in a little bit of a bind because you can't, you can't separate everything like you have to with all of the organic certification. So that was something that, um, Luckily, we had, there was, just happened to have like these four little gov old government bins uh, that we hadn't used in years, but, but uh, now we're using them. There were 3,000 bushel bins from way back, and now we're using those all the time, and, and I got a used air floors that I put in there so we can run air on them if we need to, but I found those from a neighbor who was going to get rid of his bins, and we bought those pretty cheap and moved them in. So a lot of different things that we're trying to do, but uh, uh, working on it. Then I bought a grain cleaner because I wanted to try to save the seeds I can. And, uh, and even like the, the field peas and oats, I can separate those into two different things. We actually bought an old, very old semi, but I have to uh, haul, uh, I have to haul uh, uh, grain things uh, further than I would with just the conventional stuff. The conventional stuff, we could go with gravity boxes even to the elevator is only a few miles away. Now all of a sudden I'm hauling things maybe 12, maybe 12 to 30 to 40 miles away to get to different markets. So then I might have to take my transitional non-GMO beans, I might have to run to Riceville, Iowa, which is like 40 miles away, versus taking them to the local elevator. But they pay a higher premium down at Riceville, which more than pays for it. So we had to kind of step back and look at different options like that. So these are all things that took a lot of time, but, um, uh, but they, you know, we're working on it. I think there were a couple of questions that popped up. Let's see. How do you revert an old bin to be good enough to store the grain? Well, the air floor yeah. in one that we added yeah. to one of them made a huge difference. Yeah, that we, we added to two of those little bins. A neighbor had a, a bin that was the same size and he was going to, tear it down to it. And so I just pulled the floors out of it his and put them in. It was a took, big job. It, it took a while to do and <laughs> just just cutting holes with a <laughs> with a grinder into the side to get the clean outs in there and everything else. I mean, we it took some time to do, but but it's been really nice to have because now we can, like even with the oats, you can bring them in and run some air if you have to or, or, or uh, 
corn or small grains, whatever you want to do, you can kind of do things. So, and then the roof, as long as the roof is good, you got to make sure the roof is good. So, um, and then there's one other question. So you bought what you needed and rebuilt it for your system. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose that would be, you know, we bought it and then, yeah, certain things we bought that are quite old, you know, like that, the 30 foot drill I bought was, I think it's a 1983 model. So, you know, it's got some age, but it, it works. I've had a few, you know, you got a few problems with it here and there, but you have to be, uh, or at least for, for the way we do it, since we can afford to, those are things we can afford to buy, but you have to be willing to, uh, to fix and work on, and you know, pull bearings and do it, whatever it is you need to do. Yeah, so. and like in our planter, we use the, it's the fertilizer bag. Oh, yeah. We yeah. are kind of repurposing some elements of the equipment, like the, the fertilizer box, or what's for fertilizer, or insecticide, insecticide box. on the planter. Now, what do we use? This we, year, we put we some elemental stuff. sulfur on because we were short of sulfur, so we actually spread that with the with those. I mean, I so we're we using washed them all with power wash, and we actually hadn't used those <laughs> boxes on the planter for probably eight, nine, ten years. So they've been just sitting there, and we hadn't used them. And then we thought, hey, we could put. A little sulfur uh, that elemental sulfur on because that's one thing that we really lack with our soil tests so we're trying to tailor our equipment for organic yeah to make it work yeah. the best we can so you can go to the next slide so just a couple pictures of some stuff the top left is the roller crimper i, I have that that's a, a loader mounted uh, roller crimper so that's in the front of the tractor and then i pull the planter with it so i just drive over that field one time in the spring and the goal is to wait until we combine and then then go combine in the fall. So you don't, and even though that's organic, that's certified organic ground there, um, we're not driving over the field that many times. And you can see the thick mulch that's on there um, with, with doing that. So then on the, the bottom, uh, that's our 30 foot drill. That's that old 30 foot drill that we use to plant cover crops and, and uh, things like that. To the top right, we plant cover crops, I plant all my rye, I plant oats, all that kind of stuff. Then the top right would be, that's the grain cleaner that we, we just bought, so I'm separating, actually I saved a lot of our own oats for the oat field pea mix, and I was able to clean them, and then... Uh, uh, and that, that cleaner you, uses air, so yeah. it, it has a big fan that has different settings, and so we can, um, it's a little different than the traditional cleaners. Right, right. So, but we chose this one. We thought it worked pretty well for our needs. Yeah, yeah. So I saw a quick question on the seeding rate for the rye. I put three bushel of uh, rye per acre down, and I want it planted before September fifteenth. So, but then the uh, and then the bottom of the the other one was our fertilizer spreader, where we're spreading those pellets. You can see the the row of pellets there on the ground, on the ground, and then we're loading them in. That's actually uh, our next door neighbor. He was bored one day and came over with a skid loader to help us load. So that was kind of nice. But um, we got, that's how I spread fertilizer on the corn. We'd like to cut down on that, but, but we still, you have to maintain some production. So you can go to the next slide. And then there's the, the pickup head for our combine is on the top left. Um, on the right is the swather I bought. It's just a pull behind swather, pulls, behind the tractor, those are, I was really happy with how that worked. We picked it up over by the North Dakota border up there by past Fargo. But uh, that worked really well to, because uh, we had a hundred and some acres of oats and, and we had to get that, you know, cut and that, that I was really happy with and it wasn't really expensive. Uh, you know, obviously the cultivator on the bottom. Uh, I actually had a couple of neighbors who farm a lot of, they farm a lot of ground, they're farming thousand acres each of them when I was out swathing with the the old 4020 and the umbrella on top with that toe behind swather they all there were three of them standing at the end of the field when I got to the end it was kind of funny and they said well they just wanted to see how everything was done in the 60s and I because uh, that's when most of that equipment was from we get along well uh, you know it was kind of funny and then the the bottom right is that's my gandy box it's mounted on top of our disc so when I disc, I can spread um, whatever it is. There I'm spreading rye seed as I'm disking. But um, um, 
you know, you can spread whatever you want with that gandy box. I've got different sets of wheels you can put in there so you can spread. If you want to, if I want to spread clover, which is a real light seeding rate, I can actually spread that with there, or I can come in and, and spread rye at three bushel an acre uh, with that. So I've done both, but um, you know, it's been a very uh, nice setup. So I didn't have a real good picture. I would have liked a picture not at night when we're out doing it, but um, but the other picture I can find of the gandy box that's mounted on the disc. <clears throat> and sometimes we're going all night. But, well, yeah, there are times where, yeah, we don't get a lot of sleep, but. Um, okay, another question. Oh, about are, the. Are you finding that the nutrients removed from the farm in straw and hay can be affordable, purchased back? And are you getting a premium for certified organic straw and hay? Actually, that's a good question. We we actually use all the, the straw uh, for, because with the pigs that we raise, it's a deep bedded system. And so like our, all of our cows, they farrow in a six foot by 12 foot pen and we use bedded straw, deep straw for them to farrow in and everything. Uh, so all of our straw actually gets used back through the uh, livestock. And this, the round bales of straw bedding that we use, we actually go and use it for the finishing hogs because they're in, you know, they're not in a heated space. So in the dead of winter, we put a bunch of round straw bales in there and, and you'll walk into the, into the barn and the finishing pigs and you can't see the pigs. They're all buried down in there until you make some noise and they all bump up <laughs> and the steam comes up. And I mean, they're, they do quite well and all of that, but we're, we're actually taking that straw, using it through the livestock and then we spread it back on the fields as manure. So, the nutrient, so we aren't losing the nutrients on our farm per se, we're just kind of shuffling it maybe from one field to another, but we're, uh, we're trying to keep as much on the farm as we can. And that's where we're wanting to get more cattle and the sheep and everything too, because then they can eat more of the hay and the forage. Although we will be selling some hay, I'm sure, uh, over the next couple of years, so. Uh, next slide. Oh, and uh, equipment wish list. Uh, my Ruth likes to uh, end the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's uh, there can be a list that gets very long sometimes. As with most farmers, you got a long list of things you want to buy, but you only have so many dollars to use to buy it. So you got to prioritize a little bit. Uh, but when transitioning to organic, the other thing that I've learned is you almost need to oversize your equipment for the size of your farm. You know. We were eight row equipment. We have, you know, what, 450, 500 acres. Um, and I want to jump up to 12 row. You know, we, we got a 30, 30 foot drill. We're getting, getting more and more, uh, uh, kind of getting a little bit bigger equipment. Not that we're, our farm is growing, but for organic. For organic. But it's, it's that, um, like I was saying earlier, when you have to cull, you might have to cultivate and bale hay and do all these things in the same short period of time. Well, you've got to be able to, and, and the rain is coming, which my wife can attest to me saying often, oh, it's going to rain, so you've got to really push. A the, constant state of panic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and so, you know, because you can't call a, call a co-op and have them come spray, you know, and just get that done real quick and have them do it. You've you got to be geared up. There's short windows of time where everything needs to be done. Yes. So the bigger the equipment is, it, it's helpful. You can get stuff done more timely yeah. and, and kind of not have to worry about, uh, you know, so, so we're, we're upping and, and moving for larger equipment. So, and then I'd like to get an interseeder because I'd like to do more with cover crops than what we've been doing. I'd like to get an interseeder for, for putting stuff into standing corn. And uh, at some point I'd really like a cultivator guidance system because that would really help uh, what do they say, driver fatigue when you're cultivating. So those are some things I would love to get, but I don't have as of now. So you can go to the next slide. So some challenges for transition. Um, one big thing is you need a lot more planning and management versus conventional. Because with conventional, you're doing corn and beans and you just kind of did it. And it was more autopilot, not completely. I mean, there's still a lot of thought that goes into all of that, but when you're looking at, okay, uh, you know, we're doing all these different rotations and we're trying a bunch of different things, uh, you know, you really gotta be thinking, thinking ahead and thinking about 
what are you going to do in order to control weeds? What are you going to do? And, and even if the crop looks okay, like I said with the, the oats, we went out there and terminated the oats field because the weeds were getting too bad. So then you need a plan B to put the buckwheat down or whatever other crops. Sometimes you can put different forages down. Um, so we're really, it, it takes a lot more thought, which actually is a lot of fun, but can add some stress to it. Um, and like I said, the weeds, you can't just call the elevator to take care of it. The picture in the background here is from what, three, three or four years ago. And it was a soybean field. I did not roller. I didn't, that was before I was roller crimping rye. And uh, I was trying to cultivate and tie and weed and do all this kind of stuff with the, with the soybeans and they got the weeds and it rained and the weeds got ahead of me. And uh, until I started roller crimping rye, I was like, well, I don't know if I'm going to do soybeans again. Because, <laughs> because I really, that was a struggle. And, and as you can tell, you can see a fair amount of weeds in there. And the yield was good still. We got about 50 bushel beans on that field. But boy, I tell you, did you set yourself up for some weed pressure coming forward. So, you, you know, even though the yield that year was good, you got to keep the weeds out of there the best you can for the next year. So uh, getting timing right of everything. Um, Especially finding, with the weather. Yeah, with the weather. Uh, oh, uh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, the, the, you know, cultivating, tying, weeding, you know, the, the equipment. The timing right to get things done with the weather and, and rotary hoeing, roller crimping, all of that kind of stuff. Cleaning everything during the transitional time. Actually, there's a lot that you have to do with the multiple bins, making sure everything's clean and swept and uh, blown out. And conventional oats. These are the organic oats yeah. and equipment. Every time you have to as I'm sure most of you know, you have to clean the equipment every time you go back into an organic field. Yeah. So it's complicated. It'll be nice when we're all organic. Yeah. Yeah. This year, this current year that we're in now, everything is either in transition or organic and that you still have to separate where you store everything. And, but we're farming everything as if it's organic, even though some is certified. So that has to go into different bins, but that's a little easier. And then, in the next couple of years when everything's organic life will be we're looking forward to that and then all the records and, and the cash flow during the transition uh and and some yield variation and i'll touch on that a little later uh with with all of that so you can go to the next slide this uh hay is a great uh weed control option i would say if you get a field that gets too far you know, the, where the weed pressure gets too bad in one field or even a strip of a field, you can, you know, and you're, you're just, you just get behind for whatever reason. You just come in there and put, you know, hay in there, harvest hay for a couple of years, just cut hay, and that will really cut down on your weeds because it really helps. That's, especially with thistle and some other stuff. We have one, one field that we're going to have to put hay in, I think, this year because we've got too much thistle coming, and we just got to get that thistle out of there. And the best way to do that is with, with hay. So we... That's where we're having cattle and uh, hay is an okay cash crop, but having the cattle or, or sheep, it's kind of nice because you can kind of feed that back through mm -hmm. them and maintain everything. So, uh, oh, what type of hay do we grow? It's uh, mostly an alfalfa mix. So it's, it's um, uh, yeah, mostly alfalfa with a little bit of uh, fescue ryegrass, a couple things like that mixed in with it. So. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Uh, observations about the transition. Um, well, just the amount of records you need for organic is, um, luckily, Ruth is very good at that. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, she's more diligent on that. I, I, uh, I am very glad that she is well, able even, to handle that. Well, it's, it's, a, it's still a challenge and, um, just to keep, I mean, the, cert the certifiers would like, as many of you know, um, daily field records or, you know, where. When you do well, something in the field, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And even it's just, it takes some changes in habits mm -hmm. to actually write things down or keep them on your, you know, your phone calendar. We kind of do a mix of things, but we're always looking for a better way to keep, keep records. Mm -hmm. So. We're learning. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's, a, it's a lot. Yep, yep. We're on the very early part of a learning curve, it feels like. 
So, but, and then I have some concern over GMO contamination, you know, I, with neighbor's fields and everything, you know, I, whenever I take the, that organic corn into the place and they have to test it for the GMO, I'm always a little nervous. You're kind of looking over their shoulder watching and hoping that you don't have any issues. And so far it's worked fine. We haven't had any issues, mm -hmm. but I guess it's just always kind of that back of my mind fear. Um, and the more I learn, the more, for both of us, I think, the more, more we learn, the more we realize how little we know. So that, uh, that's something that we would really, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to do about that, but we definitely know, the, the thing we definitely know is we don't know much. So, um, and a lot of people may look at the organic income potential and say, man, you know, you can get six, eight, ten dollars $10 a bushel for corn, you can get 20 bucks a bushel for beans, uh, you know, six bucks a bushel for oats and all this kind of stuff. But like many things, there's risk with it. Mm -hmm. And you got to enjoy that challenge of trying to figure out and solve a lot of problems every, <laughs> every mm -hmm. week, every month, you know, when you're looking at things, trying to say, oh boy, what do I do here? Um, and you have to be really open to trying new crops and new rotations. That's why we're doing some of these trials. Um, so and always have a plan B, like John has mentioned. Yeah, many B, times. C, or D. Be ready to mow down the oats if you have to. And yep. Yeah. I actually had to drive into yeah. our cornfield the other day. I had a big thistle patch in the middle of in the middle of it, and I just went in with the the mower and I mowed the thistle patch, which was very painful to drive into a nice looking cornfield <laughs> with a mower and just go in a few circles and take out about a third of an acre of of yeah. corn that looked okay, but I wanted to get the thistles out of there because those thistles are a pain. If anyone has a magic bullet for thistles yes. yeah, we're, on organic we're, ground, let us know. We're very open to ideas because driving into a cornfield with a mower by it, I think the neighbors would drive by and go, what is that fool doing today? <laughs> <laughs> but that's just the way it is. So, uh, next slide. Production. This is just saying where we what we're doing with our corn. This is what we've done since we've transitioned to organic. You know, a lot of people. Um, but we've had a lot of variation in corn. We've had fields from a little over 100 bushel to an acre, which uh, let's just say isn't something you'd probably uh, put on a. I guess I'm advertising it now to I don't know how many people, but, but it's not a not necessarily bragging rights, but it is what happens. And um, uh, but we've had up to 203 bushel an acre on organic corn too, depending on the field and, and what's been going on. So you kind of hit a, a wide variety all over the board, uh, but we usually end up around 165 bushel the last few years. And I think we have a lot of upward potential on the organic corn yield as we learn and rotations and get ourselves more situated on what we're doing. I think we've got a lot of upward upward potential. We have a lot of opportunity to, to improve upon that. So uh, our county average, I just want to put that in perspective for whoever is watching, was around the last couple of years, around 188 bushel per acre was the county average. So with the corn, we're not hitting the county average, but I think we, hit, we have definitely have potential to hit that average and do better. Uh, as you can see, we've had fields that have done that, but just not, we haven't been consistent enough on it. But yield isn't our number one goal. No, no, it's, so, it's margin per acre. Like that first, well, the first slide that we sh that John talked to about our vision, it's a re that we want to be a regenerative mm -hmm. farm, yet be able to make a living and focus on building the soil, and then the yield will be a consequence. Right. I mean, it will come, but um. So that's just a, a different way of looking at it. I yeah. think than a lot of conventional farmers. It's not always about your yield. It's, and it's about the, the, the 10, 12, 15, 18 year plan of, mm -hmm. of where, you know, it's gonna take a while to get to where you wanna be. And uh, yeah, I think we've got a lot of opportunity to, but it's gonna take time, so. And then the soybeans, you know, we've had more consistent yields with the soybeans. Uh, you know, we've been between 48 and 56 bushel an acre on soybeans uh, on average. For when you average the whole every you know, the whole farm, I mean, obviously you have pockets in the field that pockets that do quite well, and the county average is around 52. So we're hitting the average with the beans, uh, I would say. You know, um, so but anyway, I, you can go to the next slide. 
Uh, there's a couple of questions first. Um, first, oh. do you have a setback from your neighbor's GMO crops? Uh, oh yeah, there's there's um, actually our farm. It's it's we're set up fairly well that way because our setbacks on most of our fields would be the road or or, we the, have, river. or the river. We have the Cedar River goes right along one hole, two two sides actually of our farm, and there's woods and river and everything else there. So that's a wide setback there. And then we do own up to we only have one field that actually runs a fence line with another neighbor every other field we either have a road gravel road or a county road or something that's there so we're kind of fortunate that way the field that has the uh the, the one common fence line that one field that one we we have that's the last one we've transitioned that's the one we're in year one of transition right now but yeah we need a 25 we'll have a 25 or a 30 foot setback yeah probably a 30 foot setback there because of um uh, because of that because of yeah that's that's more for like drift though um right but the gmo contamination is more about the timing right timing of flower. yeah it it can be time yeah it can be timing of, of when your crops are coming versus when the neighbor's crops are coming we with planting corn we're always you know i mean everybody else is out planting corn and and um, uh, I talked to a, oh, a friend of ours who has been organic for 20 years. And uh, talking to him, and it's like, man, it was such a nice spring this year. And you're kind of having a hard time sitting there when everybody is out, else is out planting and we're just or done planting. or done planting. And yeah, you're talking <laughs> to neighbors started. and they're like, boy, it's been an easy spring. I bet you're happy to be done. And you're like, well, I haven't started yet. You know, it's kind of a hard thing to kind of overcome because you can't start too early with organic because you don't have treated seeds you don't have a lot of these other things and uh yeah our neighbor uh, he goes well he said just go fishing <laughs> he said just go get away not that we have time probably to do that but i mean his point was just relax it's going to be okay and uh plant when when uh when it's best for the what you're doing and don't worry about what your neighbors are doing so. so that helps a little bit with that GMO contamination. Yeah. We're planting at a different time. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Chuck. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then uh, do we move board plow to prep the seedling? Uh, the only field that I'll move board plow is, is a, a, a hay field that is an existing hay field that we want to um, terminate the hay. Then I will move board plow. However, this year I tried a field a hay field where I put uh, 18 inch sweeps on my chisel plow and I did that in the spring because I don't I, if I could figure out a method to not have any black dirt over the winter that is one big goal I have and so I tried that on a little bit this year with uh, 18 inch sweeps on a chisel disc chisel plow and uh, trying to terminate undercut all the hay that way so those are a couple of um, options and uh, no I don't use any fertilizer on our alfalfa but I will put um, manure on fields before it goes to corn. So, and to convince my dad to transition to organic, uh, he is all in now. Uh, he, was, he was nervous at first, but he's always been kind of one of those farmers in the area too. I probably got that from him where he's tried a lot of different things over the years to, um, uh, for both trying to do soil health, some of these other things. He's been really doing that for many years. And so it, I wouldn't say it was very hard to convince him, but I think he was, uh, you know, a little nervous about mm -hmm. it all. And, you know, I think. Um, the ability to stay on top of the weeds. Right. And yeah. So it was, I mean, it, it, it was, uh, it, but we started small and we were able to kind of work our way through well and i think when he started seeing some of those results too just like me uh ruth was the first one to to kind of encourage encourage it but when we started seeing some results it, it really helped with the um i guess convincing or the, the the yeah john's folks are very involved and supportive yes yeah but yeah of course uh, nervous at the same time but they're they're all in yeah i would say yeah so. that that we will that we're going to do this yeah. yes yeah yeah so okay the next slide i think we're about done here 
Um, yeah, just basically we're only at the beginning. Uh, we have a long, long way to go and we've made plenty of mistakes as you can see on this picture. That's my uh, old 30 foot drill that the one wing snapped right off this spring. Fell off right in the field and, and I feel like running away. But <laughs> that is John <laughs> That is me running. But anyway, uh, uh, we were able to get that fixed and, and uh, now it's working again, but it took, took some time to fix that. So, but like I, I say in there, as my dad says, you know, as long as I make more good decisions than bad ones, it'll be okay. <laughs> so we're trying, but yeah, next slide. Okay, thank you, that's, that's our crew. That's myself, my wife, and our four kids. So, out in uh, some produce there. All right, I guess we can open it up for more questions. There's one in the chat. What is your hay mix seeding rate? How much alfalfa, how much fescue, how much annual rye? Yeah, let's see now, I'm trying to remember. Um, I've got it written down somewhere, but I, I think uh, the alfalfa, if I'm remembering what we put in there, it's about 15, um, pounds of alfalfa. We put quite a bit of alfalfa in, and then, um, um, oh boy, I'm sorry, I cannot remember that rate off the top of my head because we actually didn't plant the. Um, we're going to have to plant the alfalfa after we take the oats this year because we got the oats in, but it was early and we we're scrambling and we couldn't get everything taken care of this year, so we're going to. Any other questions? You cut out there a bit right at the end. What's that? You cut out a bit right at the end. Yeah, I said, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm trying to um, remember the seeding rate. I've got it written down, but I don't have it if, in front of me right if now. If anyone wants to know that, maybe check. We could get the information to you and you could get it to the... Okay. Yeah. All right. Let us, probably, let us know if we should follow so, up on that. We'd be happy to. Yeah, some of these things I forget. Off the top of my head. How do you find your markets for crops and livestock? Well, the, the crops, um, I, I've been doing a lot of calling around to different buyers, but I know that there's some, uh, uh, there's some uh, marketing groups that you can contact too, and, they, and I actually might start looking more into that uh, going forward, like, um, uh, oh, Oh man, I'm drawing a total blank on their name right now. But uh, is it thinking like but, O Farm or yeah, O Farm? Yeah, O Farm uh, is a group that I think they would be a beneficial person or group to talk to. And actually, we visited with them some this year, and we might look into some of that to try to find markets, especially if we get into some winter wheats and some of these other things. They are pretty good at helping find uh, markets for that. So. And we're always, yeah, like John said, we're always looking for new or better markets, not only for the crops, but like for the sheep. Mm -hmm. We're looking right now actively for a, a better market for our hair sheep, which are for meat, and like the sunflowers, mm -hmm. exploring different markets for those right. and um, produce. And so we're all, it's always kind of an adventure looking for those. Yeah. Yeah, a good, a good resource for everyone for exploring organic grain markets is uh, our organic specialist, Carmen Fernholtz. He's, yeah. he's a great resource for all this stuff, but he, he's been really involved in O-Farm, which is a cooperative uh, for a really long time and has done a lot of different creative marketing stuff over the years. So he's, he's a great person to talk to and you can, you can reach him um, through Moses at 888-906-6737. And his extension is 715, and he's available to, to chat about that. Um, but yeah, some other questions in the chat. Is organic farming becoming more common in your area? There's not real common, I wouldn't say. There's, there's um, I know of uh, two, other, two other farms fairly close to us that are organic. I think there's one more that's like 10, 15 miles away. Um, so I would say we are definitely the... Um, yeah, it's two, well, a couple people that John, friends of his now are starting to dabble a little bit in it who are, and they're in mm -hmm. the vicinity, but there's not a lot of organic in our area. Right around us, you know, it's more, you got to go a ways. There's, 
there's there seems to be like little pockets of it around. I know some friends of ours over by Wells and some other places they do. There's more organic in some of those areas, I think. Yeah. Um, and and if you go over further east, you know, closer to the Wisconsin Minnesota border, but not a lot right around us. It can yeah. tend to happen in in pockets because people see their neighbors and they mm -hmm. think it's crazy because they don't know anything about it. Then they see their someone in their neighborhood does it well, and then they're like, huh. Maybe I could yeah. give it a shot. So, yeah, it's that kind of neighbor to neighbor transition of ideas there. Um, and then Wendy asks, with all of the work, how are you balancing work and life and family, and what are the challenges, if any? Well, um, there are challenges. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's. Um, <laughs> I would say that 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 can definitely be a challenge because yeah, we've got well four kids. And that this picture is a couple years old, but uh, they are all four in high school this year. Because there's only three and a half years difference from the oldest to the younger of, of those. And so between all their sporting events and everything else they have yeah. to be in, it feels like there are times where we're like, man, I don't yeah. know. It, it can be a challenge, but but um, I think yeah, the time and I mean, yeah. Well, I joke. I don't know if you like this joke. <laughs> we produce all this good food, organic, and we've even sold local produce and all that, but we don't have, <laughs> then we'll like put in a frozen pizza because we do not have time to <laughs> make <laughs> anything, even though I love to cook. I mean, we do often, but it's the time yeah. that we just totally run out of some nights or we're eating at midnight. Yeah, the kids the kids have gotten used to eating supper at 10.30 I mean, or 11 o'clock at night. Yeah, we're just not in the house. Like, hey, when are we eating supper? They'll say, we're like, uh, <laughs> I haven't thought about that yet. I don't know. So I would, love, I would love to dedicate more. There's just only so much time in the day is the challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we do try to get away as a family a few times a year and uh, and do a few things. So that's, you know, we, we try to coordinate it. Yeah. All right. Well, we're, we're right at time, pretty much a little bit over. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Paul and John and Ruth, for being here. Thank you, everyone, for your, your questions and your time. And, uh, yeah, I really appreciate that a lot. Um, let me just share... There's a couple um, things coming up here. Um, let's see. And then, yeah, so we have a Kernza field day coming up. So Kernza is a perennial wheat. Um, and we're, we're having a series of YouTube videos and then another virtual field day on that on July 22nd. Um, you can sign up for that now. Really excited about that. And that's actually with Carmen, who I mentioned, who's our organic specialist. Um, and there's the number for the, the organic answer line, 888-90-MOSES. Um, and I will answer, and then I'll try to answer your question or find the right one of our specialists to do that. So we have Carmen as a grain specialist, and then we have other folks who... Um, and talk you through grazing and different things like that. So, um, and I can help you with organic certification questions mainly. Um, and then we have, if you fill out the survey here, we have a free Moses swag bag. Um, and we really pay a lot of attention to the valuations and help us uh, guide our future programming, help us make our work better and more applicable to you and your farm. So please take the time to fill that out and uh, you'll be entered for a drawing. So thank you very much for your time, everyone. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> All right.